so first of all i must thank you all for sending in your questions to us the response has been overwhelming and we are here again with a long list of questions so we have clustered the questions into thematic groups so as to try and cover as much ground as possible and professor gandhi will surely answer all of those questions however i must say it's a huge canvas so um, let's see how far we can get and without further ado if we may begin now right so the first subset of questions is titled partition in historical and popular memory today as i've mentioned there are going to be several questions under each uh, subheading so here goes the first one you mentioned the vietnam wall in washington dc and what it brings to the fore what would be the significance and the complexities in a memorialization of this sort if ever in a country like india that saw the simultaneous emergence out of the cusp of colonization and the violent partition how would the politics of remembering and forgetting navigate this process recently a student wrote in an answer that jinnah was obsessed with the idea of pakistan but we find that right up to the elections of 1935 he was willing to work out a compromise that might have prevented partition is it time for history textbooks to set the narrative straight was there any third option besides partition did it bring about any good change for either india or pakistan and did it have a role in the decline of the british empire finally the last one in this group please share some light on the sufferings of women during partition over to you professor thank you very much uh, rajasmita and thanks uh, and greetings to everybody who has joined i am very happy to be interacting in fact as you have mentioned i am a biographer and ideally i would like to quiz all of you instead of you quizzing me but uh, sadly that uh, may may not be possible this time but i really am glad to be uh, interacting with all of you it, it's it's a it's a joy to me now um um so to let's let's begin with the the wall i mentioned the vietnam wall and i mentioned it in the context of uh, uh, the tragic uh, reality that we don't know the names of most of the people who were killed in the 47 partition uh, and so that really is is, is the primary uh, point of thought in my mind when i speak of the vietnam wall here but there's no uh, no record no recollections so above all uh, it is to underline the tragic uh, reality that in india we we take uh, killings uh, removal of of life from our midst uh, for granted and so that was the primary point of of, of referring referring to the wall uh, now uh, the point that you make of the connection between uh, the end of colonialism and partition and isn't there a connection between the two and of course there is and there's a connection between the end of colonialism partition and the carnage all these things are interrelated but i think there is always a case for looking at these interconnected things also in their separate places so the killings that took place the destruction of so many lives is in itself by itself a huge huge story and because the scale in during the partition killings was so enormous there is a case to be made for focusing at least for a while and in some areas on the killings uh, and so so the lack of that is, is is something that should be noted now i i will take uh, first this very major question of whether there was a third option apart from from some partition so uh, uh, I, I, here i'd like to to mention that at least my uh, attempt when i either read history or try to research it or write about it is not to try and focus on who the villains were or who the heroes were but on what the reality was agar main hindi mein kahu to main kahunga ki kya hua kaise hua kyon hua what happened how it happened why it happened rather than who were the heroes and who were the villains so i'm not saying that this should be everyone's approach but this is this is my approach uh, to to understanding history uh, i want also <clears throat> for us to recognize uh, to, to remember 
that we try to know the past and we know something about it, but people that we are studying certainly did not know the future. They, they did not know our times and we know their times, but they did not know our times. And it's very important to understand what happened then from the context of that time. So, uh, so what was the reality, say, in the 30s and the 40s before independence came and before partition occurred, before colonialism ended? The reality in India was something like this. A great many people, Indians of all kinds, in various groups and sometimes forming political parties of, of their own, had different concerns and different goals. Most of them, many of them, wanted independence from colonialism. But there was an important question of what would happen after colonialism and supposing we get independence, what happens thereafter? And among uh, many Muslims in India, there was this uh, well-recognized uh, notion that uh, since there was now going to be democracy uh, and uh, everyone would have a vote, the majority would uh, decide things. And since the Hindus of India comprise the majority, the Muslims would be in the minority. And since many Hindus uh, believe, uh, I'm now talking of the thought process in the 30s and 40s, and many Hindus believe that many wrongs were committed uh, when Mughal rulers and other Muslim rulers before the Mughals ruled India. And therefore, the many Hindus might want to take some kind of revenge. And therefore, the Muslims might be insecure and therefore, Muslims would be secure in a democratic majority rule. This was a thought in, in many minds. And this thought was accentuated in the mid to late 30s when uh, provincial governments were formed in various parts of India. Many of them were uh, governments run by the Congress Party. Uh, so provincial governments existed. And uh, now the Congress Party, although it stood for in India for all, it also had many Muslims, it had many other non-Hindus, but the vast majority of the leaders and the members of the Congress party were Hindus. And uh, yes, there were some Muslim ministers also in Congress governments in different parts of India. Uh, but the reality that uh, the Congress was largely Hindu party and was already ruling several provinces, that gave a spur to the notion that there should be uh, maybe the Muslim majority uh, areas of the then undivided India should have their own separate country, separate sovereign country after independence. And that, uh, so this was the, the logic behind the Muslim League demand in 1940 for a, uh, uh, Muslim majority areas to form, form a separate country. Now, at that time, the big reality, uh, political reality and administra administrative reality. So if you were a professional of any kind, an engineer, a doctor, a civil servant, uh, or a student, uh, or a politician, the big administrative reality or the political reality was the province the province. So uh, Punjab was an undivided area that most people now in India have even no imagination or understanding of what undivided Punjab was or what undivided Bengal was. These two have been forgotten. Uh, but at that time, that is the reality that people lived with. We are very familiar now with Jharkhand, with Uttarakhand, with Uttar Pradesh. But at that time, Punjab meant this huge Punjab, huge Punjab. So when the idea came that the Muslim majority provinces should form a separate country, which was strongly opposed by many, it was supported by quite a few. So Punjab was a Muslim majority province. Bengal was a Muslim majority province. So for many Pakistan, those who were in favor of Pakistan, it was a natural assumption that all of Punjab would go to Pakistan, all of Bengal would go to Pakistan. So this is where uh, 
Now, apart from those who are opposed to partition in principle, that India should remain united. That India was one under the British, it should, and it was one before the British, it should remain one after the British go. So that was a general proposition of, and uh, argument for opposing the Pakistan proposal. But the others said, if you want Muslim majority areas to come together, then uh, how can Muslim minority West Bengal be part of any Pakistan? How can Muslim minority East Punjab be any part? So, so, this, so uh, this is something to recognize and which is often forgotten that whereas many who opposed partition were opposed to the division of India as a whole, many defenders of Pakistan or partition were strongly opposed to the division of Punjab and the division of Bengal. They wanted the entire province. So I give this detailed background to answer this question of what the alternative might have been. So at one very important uh, uh, conference in Shimla in 46, when the cabinet mission had just come, and they stayed for three months in India. You remember three cabinet ministers of the UK spent three months in India trying to see if uh, something could be uh, worked out with the Congress, with the Muslim League, with, every, with the Sikhs, the Akali Party and so forth. So at one a very interesting meeting in Shimla, uh, Nehru said to Jinnah, if you agree to a union, I will agree to groups. If the Muslim League agrees to be part of the Indian Union, then we in the Congress party will be willing to have Muslim majority groups within the Indian Union, which would mean that all of Punjab could be part of the Muslim majority area, and all of Bengal also could be part of the Muslim majority area. So this, in summation, was the alternative. A united India, Muslim majority groups within India, which included East Punjab as part of the Muslim majority group, and West Bengal as part of the Muslim majority group, and some degree of provincial autonomy within each group. So there would be then three groups within uh, United India. There would be the Western Muslim majority group, there would be the Eastern Muslim majority group, and then there would be the rest of India, which would not have a Muslim majority, which would have a Hindu majority, and above that, a union. So, but this compromise proposal, was never pushed by anybody in the end. There was such great mistrust that uh, the Congress leaders and the others also uh, non-Congress people, but uh, let's understand that in the 30s and 40s, India was very different from today's India. So when we say Congress leaders, they represented the majority of political India. Uh, so uh, of the, certainly of the non-Muslim areas. Uh, so, but the, 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 the Muslims, uh, the co Congress leaders felt that the Muslim majority areas, if they form a separate group, they would secede from India, would not remain part of India. So the union would be destroyed. Uh, the Muslim League felt that the Congress was determined not to allow the Muslim groups to remain, that uh, uh, the Muslim groups would not remain. Uh, so there was a lack of trust. But if there had been some degree of trust, this could have been, at least in theory, and possibly even in practice, an alternative. A Union of India, Muslim majority groups that included East Punjab as part of the Western Muslim majority group, West Bengal as part of the East, uh, and then the rest of India. So, but this, uh, it, it almost was considered, and in one way, the cabinet mission plan aimed at something like this, but in their negotiations, they said one thing to the Congress and they said that they, in fact, the Muslim majority group uh, would not, uh, could not take this, would, would not even work out. Uh, the different provinces might opt out of the Muslim majority groups. This is what they told the Congress to gain Congress acceptance of the plan. They told the Muslim League that uh, you can leave the union after a few years. 
So the, the negotiations were extremely dishonest, but the thinking behind the proposal of this two or three layers uh, could have been uh, an alternative theory, at least in, in theory and possibly in practice, if it had been very strongly canvassed by all sides. Now, uh, <clears throat> did partition bring about, uh, or, or no, let me go back to Jinnah being uh, always for a compromise. Uh, <clears throat> so in Jinnah's case, throughout his career, he seemed, or in the latter part of his career, he, he had plan A and plan B. His plan A was some kind of um, great influence in India as a whole. Uh, he wanted the Muslim League to, to be the dominant uh, party in India as a whole. If that could have been given to him, he might have been willing for a united India. His plan B was Pakistan, Se completely separate, completely sovereign. If possible, including all of East Punjab, if possible, including all of West Bengal, and possible, including Assam also. This was his plan B. And it isn't as if he uh, was not adamant on, on plan B. If plan A was not possible, he was absolutely going to go for plan B. And uh, recently, there's this book that some of all of you would have heard of, Ishtiak Ahmed's book on Jinnah. And I, my own uh, take is that uh, that book gives a, a really quite a fair and objective account of exactly where Jinnah stood. But here again, uh, allow me to repeat uh, my point that our task is not to discover who the villains were, who the heroes were to find out what exactly happened. People should do their own research. Let them read Ishtiak Ahmed's book. And if they disagree with it, let them, let them. But my understanding, my understanding in my research is that, uh, that Jinnah was willing for a united India in which he would have a very dominant role and the Muslim League would have a very dominant role and which the rest of India was not willing to give him. And therefore he was absolutely determined uh, in my assessment, to, to, to want Pakistan. Now, um, did partition bring about anything good? Uh, yes, I would say that uh, there would have been no Chandigarh if there had been no partition. Uh, there would have been no Islamabad in Pakistan if there had been uh, no partition. Uh, so, uh, but, you know, uh, we have to accept the reality and not spend so much time to figure out whether it was a good change or a bad change. Uh, yes, it's a very good study to figure out how that bad change could have been avoided. But I think the important thing is to, is to accept the reality. Um, so, uh, I, when I've mentioned Sandhikar and Islamabad, those are only uh, two aspects, uh, a case can be made. Uh, you know, when provinces are divided into two or three, some advantages are seen there. Uh, so Telangana and Andhra were together, they are separate. Uh, you know, you can debate that. Some people can argue that there is some, but of course, if along with change comes bitterness, hostility, that the part you're separating from is your enemy, then of course, that is the great sadness. So it is not so much the boundary that is the source of the problem, but it is the mistrust, the dislike, the prejudice that accompanies it. An obvious point, but I think it's just worth, worth mentioning. So uh, uh, the women, uh, uh, of course, I mean, nobody who can uh, even, even uh, in a limited way study the partition story can can ignore the fact of the terrible, terrible uh, cruelty on women uh, and the rapes and the abductions. Uh, there were also the many women forced into or, or, or volunteered to encourage to these, these on, on, on our killings, or, or suicides, which we all know about. We also know it, uh, there were some very uh, tragic stories where a false story that about people were about to come and were about to attack you and to abduct your women. And therefore, even when actually there was no such threat, some women 
were encouraged to or pushed into killing themselves. And this is also part of the sad, sad story. Um, uh, there are also some heroic uh, things and, and many people worked, with, of course, many women were heroic in protecting people from the other side. And this also, uh, many uh, Sikh and Hindu women protected their Muslim neighbors. Many Muslim women protected their Hindu and Sikh neighbors. This is an amazing part of the partition story. And then afterwards, when indeed abductions took place and people were forcibly married, in many cases, people continued with their new families. Um, it was also true by and large, if one makes a comparison, although the situation was terrible on all sides, it is true that uh, uh, many Muslim families uh, were willing to take back a Muslim woman who had been abducted and made forcibly part of another family. But uh, the same was not true on the other side. Many Hindu families were not willing to accept women who had been. So this was another very sad part of the partition story. And we know also about the, the terrible violence inflicted on the bodies of, of, of women and several wonderful books have been written on these. Uh, and I think those who are maybe not aware, I would like, of course, to mention the, the work of women like Mridula Sarabhai, Kamla Patel, and many others to rescue abducted women. And, uh, and much of this work was also very uh, effective, not on a large scale, but on a very impressive scale. So I'll stop with that. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, bringing out those nuances, um, for locating this conversation really in its own time and space, which then brings out a lot of the otherwise neglected specificities of this narrative. Uh, to which end, you make several absolutely critical points. One which um, was one which I'm taking away most is, I think, the fact that many defenders of partition were strongly against the division of uh, Punjab and Bengal, um, because that then in a way opens up a lot of doors into this narrative. Um, so the next, moving on to the next subset, which is called the complexities of understanding Gandhi's role through the struggle against colonizers. Do you agree that India was birthed in 1947? Why? And for whom then did Gandhi serve before 47? All his life, Gandhi fought for a united India and never endorsed the two-nation theory. Yet finally, we got a divided nation and we see a lonely Gandhiji accepting partition. Why did he do that? Why didn't he start civil disobedience against this? Well, two very great questions, and I will try to give my take on, on both of them. So, so was India birthed? Was India born? Was India created in 1947? Well, Yes and no. Uh, there was always an India. It may have been called other things. It may have been called Hindustan once upon a time. There were various kingdoms. There was a, a notion of, uh, of India in many minds uh, for, for centuries. Even if uh, there was a notion of India in the minds of non-Indians, and there was a notion of India also in the minds, minds of Indians. But yes, there was something very distinctive about India that was created in 1947. Uh, because this was, for the first time, a democratic India. So uh, whether we think of uh, Ashoka's India, the Maurya India, or the Gupta Kingdom India, or of the uh, Sultanate India, or Mughal India, or British India, yes, there might have been notions of, of India with whatever name was given to it in earlier centuries. But in 1947, for the first time, there was something like a people's India. Neither a native monarch nor a foreign monarch was ruling. And the people had a say. Uh, it was a democratic age. And so there, there was something absolutely wonderful about what was born, what was birthed, what was created in August of 1947. Uh, and uh, so it was, uh, it belonged to everybody, uh, didn't belong to one individual or one family, uh, one dynasty. Uh, it belonged uh, not to one community, not to one caste. So it was really an amazing, amazing event uh, in the history of the world and in the history of India. For the first time, all the people, at least in theory and very often in practice, uh, or to, to, to some extent, to a large extent in practice, India state 
nation, the government belong to all the people. So from that angle, uh, August 1947 was a very, very, very major event in India's story. Um, so, and part of that question is for whom did Bapu serve before 47? Well, he was, he was before 47, Gandhi, along with others, was involved in both liberating India and trying to create a new India, uh, that the people should run uh, the country, the country should belong to the people, and that the India's people were one. So, uh, as, as we all know, that uh, in India's long story, uh, there have been tensions of all kinds. And certainly during the British rule, although there was administrative unity, there was some kind of political unity because of British rule, but at, at ground level, uh, there was a good deal of tension between groups of all kinds. There was caste and there was religion. And there, there were gender, there were, there were other very deep, deep, deep divisions. And Gandhi, while fighting for India, India's independence, was always also fighting uh, to create the new nation in terms of actual bonds between people. Uh, and I think uh, people will say that, yes, he tried, he didn't fully succeed. He himself felt he didn't fully succeed, but certainly he made a very passionate, very determined attempt, and as did many other people. So, uh, and as I think is, is well known, that apart from the political independence of India, Hindu-Muslim friendship and abolition of untouchability. Some abolition, yes, he didn't directly attack the caste system from the word go, although in, in his own uh, ashrams and in his own personal life, he very strongly uh, opposed and he adopted this uh, so-called untouchable family. It became part of the ashram. It was such a radical step that his wife wanted to leave the ashram. At that stage, this was in 1915, very soon, with the weeks of Vizara. So in his personal life, he was very radical on caste but because he needed the caste Hindus also for the independence movement. Uh, he, he, he didn't attack the caste system directly for a long time, although he attacked untouchability passionately from public too. So uh, yes, uh, so not only India's independence, not only Hindu Muslim unity, but some kind of abolition of the notion of high and low in India. These are all the creation of Indian nation where Indians bonded with one another was very much part of of uh, Gandhi's goal, and it was also, uh, if not to the same extent, uh, also the goal of many other people. So that is one thing to understand, that Gandhi was fighting for the Indian people uh, the way he, he, he thought best before independence, and of course he continued to do that in some months that he had after independence. Now, <clears throat> the other very important related question so since he was for a United Nation, he was against the two nation theory. Uh, and he had said that partition will only happen after his death. And yet he finally accepted it. Why did he not start a civil disobedience movement against it? It's a great question. And why did he not fast unto death against it? Uh, incidentally, this question was also raised and uh, he was confronted with it during his lifetime in the few months before he was killed. He gave his answer, but I will also try to give, give my answer. Um, so let's look at all the great movements that he, there was the, the Satyagraha against the Rolet Act in 1919, nationwide Satyagraha, the first, in a way, the first nationwide movement, you know, north, south, east, west of India. Then soon there was the non-cooperation movement, uh, and then the, the assault uh, uh, Satyagraha of civil disobedience in 1930. The 42 movement came later, and in between there was the individual civil disobedience movement, also very interesting and remarkable movement, 1940-41. But in all these great movements, while Gandhi often took the lead and often proposed some kind of drastic next move, these were movements with tremendous popular support. It wasn't as if Gandhi imposed his will and kind of inspired the Indian people to go against their wishes. Some of these great movements, were, yes, they had an inspired leadership, of course, Gandhi and by some other, several others, but it was, it was something that was, had very strong backing. So what was the situation in 1947? Please, those who read carefully the story of 46, 47, 
No. That a very great event took place early in March of 1947 in West Punjab. And uh, Rawal Pindi and Multan area killings took place. And many Sikh and Hindu families, they were pushed out of those areas. They left, they left. And in March 47, the Akalis, the Sikhs, and the Hindu leaders, Congress leaders of Punjab all said Punjab must be partitioned. That there must be an area of Punjab where the Hindus and Sikhs will feel safe from the Muslims. Similarly, in, Be in Bengal, there was a tremendous movement led by Shama Prasad Mukherjee and many others that Bengal must be partitioned. That there must be an area of Bengal where the Hindus can live on their own. So the call for partition came from the Hindus and Sikhs of Punjab and the, and the Hindus of West Bengal also, apart from, from the Muslim, Muslim League. Now, and the Congress agreed. Nehru, uh, by the way, uh, as is well known, uh, the first person who became absolutely enthusiastic about partition from December of 46 was Vallabh Bhai Bhatti. And then Nehru also came around. All the Congress leaders came around. And they, they were convinced, and the bulk of India at that time was convinced. So it isn't as if a few leaders and the British agreed that there should be partition and everybody else was bamboozled or compelled into it. No, no, no. The general mood in India at the time was too much, let the Muslim majority areas go and we will manage India. Jinnah is an impossible person to live with, work with. And we will now manage the rest of India as best as we can. So, and Gandhi was very pained by this, was very sad by this. It is absolutely true that Gandhi had once said, this was in 1940, uh, at a meeting of the Congress, that partition will take place over my dead body. Uh, but he, when he saw this, he, he, there was nothing that he felt he could do. Uh, and there are those, you know, if you, if you read, uh, that's well worth reading, by the way, Gandhi's statement on June 14 or 15 in Delhi, 47, when he accepted the partition plan. The Congress leader said to him, we want you to speak and give your acceptance. And he agreed to do this. Uh, Kripalani was the president by this time, I think. Yes, and uh, Malala Azad was there. And so uh, Nehru and Patel, of course, and Gandhi did. But in that statement where he accepts partition, he, he said that I would have done it alone if I had felt the strength. But when the public is not with me, when there is no determination on the part of the others. It is not his exact word, but something like that. So in short, I'm not saying it was the right thing or the wrong thing. What I'm saying is that Gandhi did not feel that any fast that he undertook on the question would be supported by the general public. Now, mind you, there was, uh, I said that there was general feeling of acceptance of, uh, well, let's let, let the Muslim majority areas go. We will have, we'll be free of Jinnah. We will, that headache will go. Uh, yes, there were some people who were against partition at all. You might say the extreme Hindu group, where this, it was not very large at the time, a small group, but they certainly were against the partition idea, but they didn't have the strength to prevent it. Uh, and they didn't have uh, the ability to, uh, to, pr to prevent it. As, as I said, the majority of the Hindus and Sikhs of West Punjab, of Punjab, were at this point. They wanted a space uh, where uh, Hindus and Sikhs could be in a major majority. And this, the same was true. Uh, although in, in, in Bengal, it's true that Sarat Bose tried very much to have a united Bengal. Uh, it was not, uh, it didn't quite take off his campaign, although he tried very, very hard for it. And 
So in short, uh, Gandhi did not go on a fast uh, because he felt that the strong currents of public opinion were very much in favor and that there was no way in which he could resist it by himself. Thank you for bringing out those complexities um, from understanding the time itself to, uh, to understanding the role of Gandhi specifically during this time. Um, often conversations around what was particularly significant about the India created in 47, um, we, we kind of missed this point that you uh, made so importantly that it was a democratic India for the first time, democratic as we understand it now, of course. And uh, then bringing that down to uh, what, what could have Gandhi done differently? And to that end, well, he did not have the popular support that he did in his earlier movements of resistance. Uh, so thank you for pointing that out, that it, it wasn't very possible to take off a movement on his own where uh, popular support was lacking. And then what the, the, the popular opinion rather was to have uh, these regions divided better than um, together. So uh, moving on, the next one that I have is called colonial, sorry, colonization of the mind, the Indian army under the British empire at the moment of the formation of a new nation. We increasingly talk about the colonization of the mind as the strongest marker of the colonial project. Taking that thought further, how much did the years of training of the Indian soldiers under the British Empire as representatives of the empire in their respective villages and the prohibition on their mixing across religions in the army, despite having a shared history and shared present, feed into them participating heavily in the carnage in Punjab instead of trying to reduce its impact, if not stop it? If the soldiers had been given a choice as to which country they would join, how different would Indo-Pakistan border relations have been then and now? Thank you for these uh, important questions. Uh, uh, yes, and uh, it is something that is now increasingly recognized that in the killings of 1947, the demobilized soldiers uh, also played a part. Uh, the, Muslim soldiers, Sikh soldiers, Hindu soldiers. And as is well known, Punjab was always contributing a very large share uh, to the armies of the British. And it was true in the First World War, Second World War. And um, so the war ended, 45 soldiers were demobilized. And so a large number of demobilized soldiers, and some of them perhaps even with some, some guns or weapons, uh, which they had uh, taken with them home from uh, the army, uh, that they were in a position to use these weapons and the training and their abilities in some kind of uh, forceful or violent action. And uh, it is also true, it's also rec recognized that many of the active uh, uh, leaders of the killings in 47 on both sides were also, some of them were from the INA, uh, some of the uh, Subhash losses uh, in the National Army um, uh, also took part in the in the killings, and uh, even in the move into Kashmir in October of, of, of uh, forty-seven, uh, some leadership was given by some former um, figures in the Indian National Army. So both the soldiers. Of course, they were the majority who joined the uh, British Army and then those who, Indian National Army also after the war ended. Uh, they all, instead of becoming remaining Indian soldiers, they became either Muslim soldiers or Hindu soldiers or Sikh soldiers. This is the very, very great uh, reality and tragedy also. Uh, so, and this has had much to do with the uh, successful British policy in in Punjab, the, uh, over, uh, over the decades. Yes, the British recruited a good chunk or even the bulk of the army from Punjab, but they managed to keep this army absolutely divided on religious lines. And uh, so you had uh, 
Sikh soldiers and leaders in the Sikh community uh, establishing or being uh, susceptible to the creation of a new special relationship between the British and the Sikhs. Similarly, the Muslim community, similarly, the Hindu community. So in each military camp, in each military station, there was this incredible, uh, you might say, uh, a path or a passage where the Sikhs could approach the British, the Muslims could approach the British, the Hindus could approach the British, but the Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs could not approach one another. So this was an, an amazing success of the British in, in keeping uh, the religious element so strong within the army and in dividing the army on religious lines. And uh, this, of course, uh, you know, was a, was a deliberate policy of the British after the 1857 movement when they saw how the unity of the Muslims and the Hindus had nearly shaken their empire. So they were determined not to allow a repetition of that. But I think the tragedy is that the uh, Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs of Punjab and elsewhere also fell into this and cooperated in this uh, implementation of this divided rule strategy. And so, uh, and I, I've said this before, others have also said it, but this is a simple way of understanding this. This is Maulana Muhammad Ali's well-known remark when he was told that the British are dividing and ruling they divide and rule, they divide and rule. They, and he said, yes, it is true they divide and rule, but we divide and they rule. We divide and they rule. So he was keen that the Indians should assume also responsibility and not make themselves to be absolutely helpless victims of, of, a, of a divisive and evil policy. There was an evil policy, but we were not so helpless. And I think it, it is this that has to be really accepted that uh, uh, yes, uh, now even now, uh, and wonderful stories and books are written about Indian participation in World War I, Indian participation in World War II. Tremendous, uh, successful, effective stories are written and they, and they deserve to be written. But uh, uh, it, is a, it is something to be to recognize that this enthusiasm for participation uh, under the allied flag against, yes, Hitler was a terrible enemy, is one thing. Uh, so that kind of enthusiasm was generated, but the enthusiasm for Hindu-Muslim Sikh partnership for rebuilding India was not sustained. And this is where uh, a very strong uh, searchlight has to be shown, has to be extended to, to this reality of why, uh, uh, especially in Punjab, but elsewhere also, uh, this camarad camaraderie between all the Indian soldiers amongst one another could not be sustained. And of course, this is also true outside uh, the army. And it, it is true that in many of the very, very serious and horrible killings of 47, demobilized soldiers played a, played a prominent part in organizing the massacres, organizing, you know, everybody knows about these trains that were stopped and everybody was killed. But often these trains were stopped and uh, uh, through the aid of demobilized soldiers. So this is also uh, worth, worth recognizing. And uh, so if soldiers had been given a choice as to which country they would join, how different would India? Yes, it's very important to recognize that at, at some stage during the negotiation, just before partition, shortly before partition, it was agreed that uh, uh, the soldiers would, the Muslim soldiers would go to Pakistan, among Muslim soldiers, uh, apart from it was not. So basically, there was some kind of uh, separation of the armies. Uh, uh, and individual soldiers in individual regiments were probably not given a choice as to which country they would join. But I, I don't know whether in that atmosphere of 47, yes, uh, eventually, as, as people know, there were a great many Muslim soldiers in the Indian Army, even in the Kashmir fight, outstanding Muslim soldiers took part on the Indian side also. Uh, but looking at it realistically, it's not clear that uh, if, if soldiers, uh, if, if the British and the Indians and the Muslim League, the Congress, everybody had all agreed 
that soldiers would have a completely free choice as to which country that they would join. Uh, I don't know whether at that stage it was really realistic to think that Sikh and Hindu soldiers of Punjab would have joined the Pakistani army in large numbers or that Muslim soldiers from West Punjab would have joined the Indian army in large numbers in the atmosphere of 1947. I don't think that would have been a realistic uh, result in that climate of 1947. Thank you. Again, some very important points um, there, uh, particularly the success of the British rulers in keeping the religious element so divisive within the army that uh, by the end of it, instead of identifying as Indian soldiers, they become Hindu, Muslim, Sikh soldiers. So um, the next one, the next group is titled Revisiting Some Critical Junctures in the Making of the Historical Moment that Independence Along with Partition Laws. You've said that the period between 1919 and 1922 was that of communal harmony in the Punjab. Yet at this time, the rest of the country was witnessing increasing communalization in the stepped up activities of the Hindu Mahasabha in the North and the Mokla Rebellion in the, in the South. Your comments, please. You mentioned that 1857, which in popular memory and even historically, is seen as a critical juncture of some sort in thinking about the struggle towards independence, did not take off in Punjab as opposed to the neighboring states of Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, and many other parts. Why did 1857 not take off in Punjab then? While understanding the shortcomings and issues with the demands of the Unionist Party, two things about the composition of the party that was striking that the party attracted small farmers and that it was a Hindu Muslim Sikh party in Punjab, both distinctive traits for any political party at the time. What was specific about the Unionist Party that attracted this kind of a more all-encompassing mobilization then? And finally, the last one in the subset. In Punjab, shouldn't Gurdaspur have been given to Pakistan as it was a Muslim majority? Was it only kept back to give company to Amritsar on the western side of the Satluj River? On that note, shouldn't Firozpur have been given to Pakistan, considering that it was the same that it was in the same position as Amritsar was in, except on the other side of the river? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, so, 1919, 1922, that I had said period, that three-year period was saw some communal harmony in Punjab. Yet at this time, uh, there was increasing communalization in activities of the Hindu Mahasabha in the North and the Mopla rebellion in the South, my comments. So I'm not sure if I have quite strongly said that those three years saw a great deal of communal harmony across Punjab. What it, those three years did see was amazing partnership uh, between uh, Muslim, Hindu, and Sikh leaders all across Punjab. It was an incredible period in much of India, but especially in Punjab. And uh, Lala Lajpat Raya afterwards became, you might say, an important Hindu leader, uh, very important, but did speak of that period himself many years later as an amazing period of partnership. And you recall also that Hindu leaders had been invited to mosques to speak in, in, the, in that period in Lahore, in Padshahi Mosque. So there was something absolutely amazing about, about that period. And it's also true that it, that period saw communalization in other parts of, uh, of India. And there was the Mopla rebellion uh, in the Malabar part. Malabar then, because uh, now part of the state of Kerala, it was then part of Madras presidency. It was not part of Kerala state. It was directly ruled by the British. There was Travancore, there was Cochin. By the way, this brings me to a very important element which you've not touched upon at all, which is very, very important. Uh, this, the princely states of India were a very ma major reality in the 30s and 40s. We're talking about partition and what happened. We must not forget that the princely states were a very major element. Many of them had Hindu rulers, many of them had Sikh rulers, Muslim rulers. Uh, so uh, but that's a very major uh, aspect that must be, we can't understand what's happening over partition if, without simultaneously trying to understand something about the princely states. Anyway. So uh, the Mopla rebellion of 1921 in, in, in the Malabar part, now Kerala, and then part of Madras presidency, 
Calicut and elsewhere in other, other very important places. Incidentally, uh, earlier somebody kindly mentioned my uh, South India book that has a quite a de detailed account of the, of the Mopla, Mopla rebellion. Now the Mopla rebellion uh, had, uh, it was against landlords, it was against the British, it was against, in some cases, against the Hindus also. Uh, uh, and uh, there was a good deal of violence in it, and there was a good deal of violence also in the way it was suppressed in the, by the British. It did take place, uh, it was, and it, it affected the nationwide movement. But I think it's important to recognize that just as even today, uh, even today's India is not necessarily identical north to south, east to west. The different parts of India see different currents at the same time. So although the Mopla rebellion uh, was a very major reality and it did, did affect Hindu-Muslim relations, uh, uh, but it was confined to that area. And at that time when it happened, so you know, well after the Mopla rebellion had taken place and news of it had reached different parts of India, the non-cooperation movement continued until February of 22, when because of the Chauri Chara incident and so forth, uh, Gandhi suspended the movement, but that's a separate story. But it's important to note that, the, uh, that it was perfectly possible in the 1920s as it is possible in the 2020s for simultaneously and seemingly conflicting uh, movements and currents uh, to be flowing in, in different parts, parts of the subcontinent should not be surprise, surprising. Um, so, uh, so what, what is worth uh, considering is what responses uh, people offered at the time to this. In, 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 so that is that is an important issue. Now, um, Why did 1857 not take off in Punjab as opposed to Bihar UP and many other parts? Very interesting question. Now, <clears throat> there, uh, you know, something to recognize is that in the 1840s, there were two wars between the British and the Sikhs who were then ruling Punjab. This too is uh, something worth noting that before the British, Punjab was ruled by the Sikhs. The Muslims were the majority community. Hindus were the next in terms of numbers. Sikhs were the smallest, but the Sikh community ruled all of Punjab. Uh, more or less, you know, of course, after Aurangzeb died in 1707, there was a lull for some time. There was some kind of a vacuum in infighting. Eventually the Sikhs took control portion by portion and this small minority in Punjab, but then Abel and Ranjit Singh came and then others came after he died. So very broadly and superficially, you could say that the Mughals and then the Sikhs and then the British as far as Punjab is concerned. So um, the, the Sikhs put up an incredibly tough fight in the mid 1840s. And then the British finally defeated the Sikhs and took over, took over Punjab. And then uh, two or three years thereafter, there was, quite, there was a mini 1857 in the late 1840s already in Punjab but confined to Punjab, led by some of the Sikh leaders and some, some non-Sikhs also. But that was uh, effectively suppressed. And then uh, there were the two brothers, uh, John Lawrence and Henry Lawrence, and other British officers, gave a very interesting in, uh, rule to Punjab and uh, very clever. And uh, so uh, they, they were able not only to prevent the 1857 thing from uh, making an impact and, and spreading in Punjab, they actually used Punjab and they used soldiers of Punjab, uh, many Sikh soldiers, many Punjabi Muslim soldiers and some Dogra Hindu soldiers in Punjab, also to suppress the 1857 movement elsewhere. So not only was Punjab not an active participant in the 1857 movement, it was, Elements of Punjab were very strong elements in the British Empire's armory in suppressing the 1857 movement. Um, and so, uh, so the, the, uh, the British admi administrators, the provincial British administrators in Punjab were more effective 
in uh, anticipating and suppressing a potential 1857 movement. And then as is well known uh, from Delhi, this telegraph message went to Punjab about the 1857 rising. And then the British mobilized all their resources and used Punjab as a base to successfully suppress the 1857 movement. Um, one other thing to bear in mind, of course, is that uh, uh, the, at least the titular leader of the 1857 movement eventually was Bahadur Shah Zafar, the Mughal ruler. Now, the Mughal ruler did, did not enjoy this prestige in Punjab as he did in Delhi, UP, elsewhere. Uh, Punjab had seen, even among the Muslims, some kind of unease or rebellion against the Mughal ruler. And certainly the Sikh rulers of Punjab had no love for the Mughal throne. So this also was an element in the, uh, even so, despite all that, when 1857 did happen, the British were afraid that if the, if the Punjab caught the spirit of 1857, it could be very big because they knew of the strength of the uh, so, soldiers of uh, Punjab, soldiers of all backgrounds. But I think the fact that uh, uh, th there was a Mughal uh, ruler who was the, the head of the 57 uh, movement eventually. That was not necessarily uh, something to excite everybody in Punjab. Uh, so this also is an element that I think should be kept in mind. Uh, Unionist party. It is true that the Unionist party was a Hindu Muslim Sikh party. Uh, the Hindu element was the least significant. Uh, the Muslim element was strong, the Sikh element was strong, the Hindu element was a little less strong, but there was also a Hindu element. It's not correct to say, and I'm not sure I said that, that the party attracted small farmers only. In fact, small farmers were a small part of the Unionist Party. The large farmers were a part of the Unionist Party. The big landlords were part of the Unionist Party. Yes, many small farmers at that time, many small farmers were also connected for economic reasons and for social reasons to the big landlords. So the small farmers didn't have independent movements against the big farmers. They also kind of associated with the large farmers. So as I've said uh, that yes, Unionist, Unionist Party had these two terrible flaws. It was pro-feudal, it was pro-empire. Those were two very major weaknesses, but it had this very great positive that it was the Hindu Muslim Sikh party and the failure of the Congress party to build links with the Unionist Party of Punjab uh, is certainly an important reason. If it, if this, now this happened in the 20s, in the 30s, in the 40s, as the Unionist Party grew. If at that stage, if the Congress leaders of Punjab and nationally uh, had been willing to say, all right, we have this anti-feudal sentiment, but uh, working with the Muslims and Sikhs is also important. So let us keep that anti-feudal sentiment to one side, let us see if we can have some kind of cooperation. Uh, but then, you know, as I've also mentioned before that the uh, Congress party in Punjab was essentially a Hindu party. It was also essentially a, uh, an urban party. Uh, the Sikhs did have some uh, uh, influence in the countryside, the Kalis. Uh, some of the Muslim parties, but Muslim League as such was also an urban party. Uh, so, but that was definitely the inability of those who wanted India to become independent and India to remain nation for all, uh, fighting against communalism, against British imperialism, that the Unionist Party, if it could have been enlisted earlier, eventually, of course, Khizr Hayat did become the Unionist uh, Chief Minister of all of Punjab. Congress supported, Sikh supported him for some time until partition. But that, uh, uh, so, 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 so what, what was successful for the Unionist Party? A, it had some very impressive and able, capable leaders, including this man, Fazli Hussain, uh, who was a barrister, who himself was not a landlord. He was a city man, but he was able to guide the Unionist Party. Uh, and yes, Unionist Party was encouraged by the British, very much so the British, so that, you know, the support from a very powerful government, which has money and resources influence, does give a political party some, some, uh, some weight, some 
in, in, in the eyes of everybody. So, uh, but uh, it's good. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question because Unionist Party should be studied and the failure of the Congress to build a successful alliance with the Unionist Party can also be, uh, also be studied. So why wasn't Gurdaspur given to Pakistan under the Radcliffe Award? It was a Muslim majority area. Well, the district of Gurdaspur has many different, uh, had even many different areas. Some had the Muslim, overall it had a slight Muslim majority. In some areas it did not have a Muslim majority. And of course it was, most of it was kept to India. Some of it was given to Pakistan by the Radcliffe Award. And uh, so uh, this is a, so the question is, shouldn't Firozpur have been given to Pakistan, considering it was in the same position as it was, except on the other side of the river? So I don't know whether I am qualified here to uh, make judgments on what should have been given to Pakistan, what should have been given to India. I know that in Pakistan, there's a very strong feeling, very, 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 very strong feeling that the Radcliffe Award was unfair to Pakistan, and they, they link it also to to Mountbatten, they, they say that Mountbatten influenced uh, uh, Radcliffe. Uh, they say that Nehru influenced Mountbatten, who influenced Radcliffe, and therefore Gurdaspur went to India, and therefore India had access to Kashmir. So there's a, that's a very, very, very powerful argument in Pakistan. I think we should recognize this. We should recognize this fact that Radcliffe himself has le left very few papers, in very uh, not given his reasoning, but uh, this, uh, but uh, I think as has been mentioned that uh, in my book also, I think that Wavell is well before uh, partition was thought of, but uh, officially made a plan. But Wavell had left a note uh, saying that, Firo that uh, Gurdaspur and Amritsar should go together eventually if anything should happen and this note was uh, obviously an important note that Radcliffe also uh, gave some importance to and that was part of, of the reasoning but I think beyond saying that the Pakistanis have nursed this very deep feeling of some unfairness over uh, Rudaspur and Firozpur, I don't know whether I have the knowledge enough or the, or, or the scholarship enough to make a categorical statement that the Radcliffe Award should have gone, changed, been changed this way or that way. I recognize the depth of Pakistani feeling on this, but I'm not able to go beyond that to endorse it totally myself. But I will again say this, which I've said before, and which very few Indian scholars have paid any attention to, or Pakistani scholars, which is this. We, we, we satirize Radcliffe, we write poems about him, we make jokes about him, but my goodness, Radcliffe was only the chair of a five member commission. And both in the East and in the West, the other four were Indians, two Muslims and two non-Muslims. If those four could not agree, should we not focus as much attention on the failure of those four to agree than on the uh, ignorance of this man Radcliffe. I mean, are we so helpless that all we can do in our historical research is to make fun of uh, this minority English judge? If three of the four had come together, the whole story could have been different. Let us please also reflect on that, both in the East and in the West. Why couldn't three of the four Indian judges come up with an agreed solution, which was better than what Radcliffe drew. That's it. Well, what can I say? How aptly is this titled Forgotten Realities of the Partition Story? Because uh, the Radcliffe line is so deeply ingrained in our minds that we yeah. really don't get around to looking much beyond who else comprised of this um, commission that went on to really not have an agreement on this. Therefore, we had partition and not just this one person. And also for pointing us towards these uh, directions of understanding that there were parallel movements um, cutting across the national fabric, simultaneously conflicting. And that's not very much surprising um, from, from then to now, as is quite evident. 
and also uh, the point that you made right at the beginning uh, of understanding of realizing the importance of the princely states in this whole conversation. Um, and finally, the last two questions of uh, 1857 not taking off in Punjab and the Unionist Party. I think I go back to also the last question that you answered about how the British administrators ingrained this very decisive element of religion within the army. So uh, I find deep connections within that when you uh, answer these two questions. And uh, the last set that I have for the evening is the making and performance of a culture in modern India. In the preface to your book, you write about the sudden linguistic and demographic shift in Delhi in 1947, until then a non-Punjabi world, and confess to growing up with a mild anti-Punjabi prejudice. Could you expand on this a little more? your own recollections as a school child during these years, and on what contributed to this prevalent anti-Punjabi prejudice. What kind of role did the Mughal Empire and its relations with Punjab play on the development of Sikhism, particularly under Guru Gobind Singh? Two very different questions, but clapped together very understandably. I try to offer my take on, on them. So uh, yes, I wrote in the preface of my Punjab book that I grew up uh, with a mild anti-Punjabi prejudice. So this, of course, was a personal uh, weakness. And there, there were obviously personal reasons which might not have applied to others in Delhi at the time. It had much to do with the school where I was studying. And so this, uh, this school, I think it had one vice principal who probably was a Punjabi. This is before 47, before partition came. Uh, Mr. Rajpal was his name. He was a very good man. I think he was a Punjabi, but I'm not sure. But apart from him, all the other teachers were non-Punjabis. And some of them were Bengalis. This, this school in New Delhi had a very large Bengali influence. It, had, it also had Sikh influence and it had Jain influence. Uh, and uh, the, the teachers were, uh, many of them were Mathur teachers. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, and uh, so uh, names like Goyals, and you know, there were many Bengali teachers, some Jain teachers, uh, uh, some not too many Sikhs in the teaching area, but there, uh, there was Sikh influence is very strong in the management of the school. But it was um, somehow, you know, this mild as children, you know, 10, 11, 12 eight, nine, 12, 13, you, you hear kind of remarks about accents and pronunciations and how Hindi is spoken. Uh, so, and the purists of, of Hindi pronunciation uh, would imitate and make fun of uh, what they thought was Punjabi pronunciation. So I think these were, uh, so, so how Hindi was spoken or how English is pronounced, these are uh, silly things, but these are real things. And not, not necessarily deep things. They don't make you lifelong uh, uh, dislikers of particular groups, but they, they, they had entered my mind. So uh, it is true. So when suddenly in 40, uh, August 47, uh, many Punjabi Hindu and Sikh teachers came and many Punjabi and Hindu students came and joined the school. Uh, some Muslim students left the school, some Muslim teachers left the school. And uh, the name of the house, the Akbar house, the Akbar house then became Shivaji house overnight. <laughs> so, uh, and then I encountered so many Punjabis, uh, both as students and as teachers, and I found how wonderful these people. And I, I even so I, I realized how silly my my uh, my bias was, but I think this was the background of, of my bias and the background of how it was eventually kind of I, I got free of it. Thank God. Uh, so what kind of role did the Mughal Empire and its relations with Punjab play on the development of Sikhism, particularly in the Guru Gobind Singh? This is a very major question. So let me try and uh, reflect upon it. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> uh, let us realize that 
not necessarily with Guru Nanak, but later on, eventually. Uh, with many of the great Sikh gurus, not only was there a religious mobilization, but there was some kind of gathering which could be seen or understood or misunderstood as a political mobilization. So in, a new faith was growing, but it was also emerging as a new political center. Uh, so, uh, so the Mughal emperors uh, saw this emergence of Sikhism, not just as a religious kind of challenge, but as a political challenge also. So this is something I think to recognize when we understand the relationship between the Mughal Empire and the Sikh community, the Sikh leaders and, and Punjab as a whole. And, and the Guru Gobind Singh, so uh, now we know that Guru Gobind Singh had his, his children were killed and he had this fight against the Mughals, which we know this courageous, incredible fight. And then he was himself killed. Uh, and thereafter, um, also many developments took place. Um, and so I think it's fair to say that uh, with, uh, uh, so Punjab then saw uh, something simultaneous, something happening on the religious uh, uh, dimension, but there was something also happening in the political dimension. And this was a factor very much in the development of, uh, so question also includes uh, something about the development of Sikhism. So um, this is important to recognize and to study. Uh, uh, let us also recognize that when Guru Nanak came, at least for some time, some people, saw uh, Sikhism as some kind of synthesis of Islam in, in, in Hinduism or some kind of bringing Hindu, Hindus and Sikhs together. So this is one. I'm not saying everybody looked like it, but some people look, looked at it this way. And, and as we all know, if you go to a Sikh Gurdwara, uh, you see that in some ways uh, it has similarities to a mosque. There are no idols. Uh, there are no gods and goddesses. And just as the Muslims honor the Holy Quran, the Sikhs honor Guru Granth Sahib. So there are these, uh, some similarities and, and the one uh, eternal almighty is, is common to uh, Islam and Sikhism. On the other hand, there are many things between Sikhism and Hinduism that are also very, very common, very common. And so, so that, that was one, dimension of Sikhism is as a religious idea or, or, a, or a religious point of view that could, could reconcile uh, Hinduism and Islam. So that was one, you might say, his role of Sikhism. But the other role of Sikhism, which I have also already indicated, that uh, under the Sikh umbrella, uh, there was also a political center that was emerging in Punjab, which could be a rival political center. So there was both a, a kind of reconciling element in Sikhism, but also you might say an element that could see, be seen as threatening by the Mughal Empire. So these are two things that we, these are all very delicate and important issues. And you know, on the, on the, one, on the one hand, they indicate the possibility of Hindus, Muslim Sikhs all coming together. And, and developing not only just tolerance, but some kind of identifying even the commonality in their religious thinking. So, so there is a great reconciling dimension to this, but there's also this history of conflict, of brutal conflict, of torture, killings, of rebellion. So, uh, so this uh, is something very important for us to recognize that Sometimes wonderfully hope giving things then begin to acquire a, another dimension and sometimes a negative dimension, which always, but it also means that there is great hope for the future too. 
if we can pick out the reconciling strands in, in various currents and build on those. So I'll stop with that. Thank you so much for answering all of those questions in so much detail. And with that, we come to the end of our list of questions. Um, again, there, were, there are a lot of critical reflections to take away from there. But uh, without me spending more time, uh, if I may now invite uh, a special guest who's here with us, who's joining us this evening, uh, Arvind Narayan. He's a lawyer, a little bit about him before uh, I can invite him to join Professor Gandhi in conversation over the next couple of minutes. Uh, Mr. Arvind Narayan is a lawyer and writer based in Bangalore. He's a founder member of the Alternative Law Forum a space devoted to human rights research and practice. He's the co-editor of Law Like Love, Queer Perspectives on Law, and co-author of Breathing Life into the Constitution and the Preamble, a brief introduction. He was also part of the team of lawyers challenging se Section 377 on the Indian Penal Code, right from the High Court in 2009 to the Supreme Court in 2018. We welcome you, sir. Thank you, Rajeshi, and thank you, Mega, for this uh, really very kind introduction and for this really great honor to really speak to uh, Professor Gandhi, who I have been uh, a great uh, fan of in terms of reading his books and, and learning a lot from them. And in particular, his biography on Gandhi Mohandas is really one of my favorite books. And if anybody's not read it, I really urge you to go back and, and read it again. And uh, I think I'll just take up from where Professor Gandhi left off in terms of the, he talked, he talked, he stopped by talking about the question of hope. And in a sense, I think we come from very different disciplinary backgrounds, obviously. And um, I think what unites all of us, I, my senses in this particular gathering is we're all interested in the role that history can play in terms of imagining or going towards the future. Professor Gandhi was very clear that we don't go to history in terms of counterfactuals, say what could have happened, but what are the lessons we can pick up from history? And in that dimension, I thought the talk was a very, very educative and moving and immersive experience really. And I want to pick up a couple of points which Professor Gandhi made and maybe just speak a little bit about it. Firstly, the point he made about the question of memorialization and which he did address. And I thought the one dimension which I really thought was very powerful was his invocation of the memory of those who fought against partition or those who preserved their humanity in the midst of the inhumanity that was partition. So when we talk about a memorial, what I think we really, really miss is really the stories of humanity for people who stood with each other and then join in the bloodshed and the violence at that moment in time. Why I mentioned this is important is it reminds me again of uh, Milan Kundera's really beautiful statement when he says that the struggle of man against power is a struggle of memory against forgetting. So really, it's these stories which we can see as holding a path in a sense to a future. So I think we need to recuperate and recover these stories and tell them and again and again to remind us that there are other futures which are possible. I'll give you one contemporary example is we all know about the recent judgment of the of the CBI court acquitting all the accused in the Babri Masjid case. And I was just thinking back upon it and going back to, to Gujarat, at the height of uh, the, after the pogroms, there was a very uh, marvelous judgment given in the context of Naroda Patia uh, massacre which happened, where a judge called Jyotsna Yagnik delivered a judgment convicting several of the accused, including Maya Ben Kodnani at that moment in time. Why I mentioned that is again, in our contemporary uh, anger and in a sense, a contemporary sense of frustration, we often forget that there are good people who stand up sometimes in the most difficult times. And again, if you go back to someone like Hannah Arendt and her work on Eichmann in Jerusalem, the point again is this, that even in the most difficult times, you can get maybe, you can convert pe most people into ideologues most people into hate, into people, into instruments of hate. But there'll always be people who will stand by and say, this is not something we stand by. This is not something we're part of. And then I think Professor Gandhi's work really reminds us very, very powerfully about. The second point I want to pick up on 
is his is very powerful invocation of Jallianwala Bagh. And again, the report we went back to in that context, uh, in terms of the way he explained it, was actually a report authored by by Mahatma Gandhi on the Jallianwala Bagh massacre. We go back to it again because again it's a question of history. Because if you look at the history of fact finding in this country, I mean, in my own personal opinion is that there's no better report which has been report which is which has been authored on any human rights fact-finding issue than the report authored, authored by Gandhi on the Jalan Balabagh massacre. And why I say this is because it does two things. Firstly, it has particularly the sense of history. It says Jalan Balabagh is not the result of a, of a, of a one-off bad apple, as it were, called General Dyer, but it's the result of a culmination of British colonial policy. So in a sense, his lecture again, is an invocation for us to trace the history when contemporary events. So that's a question again, we can go back to it. Each of the events we see today, can we view it within the broader or the larger lens, lens of history itself? And third quick point I want to make is when he invoked the question of the roll attack agitation and the importance of that agitation. Again, we know the importance of that agitation. Because if you look at the, the, the text of the roll attack, what is the fundamental problem of the roll attack? It was, a, it was an act which legislated and allowed for pre-trial detention. We have a law in place today called the UAPA, which is allowing for pre-trial detention. And it's precisely in its, in its details, it is the same as the, uh, as the then Rahul attack, the, the UAPA today. So the simple point one has to make is we have to view Mahatma Gandhi as not just uh, exemplar of a range of things, but also as an exemplar of the issue of political freedom. And that's why it becomes very, very important from a contemporary point of view or a contemporary, uh, contemporary context. And as Professor Gandhi made the point, he said that was a psychological watershed in the history of modern India. The fact that we did, or we did, we began a protest against the law, which, was, which took away the liberties of individuals. Again, we need to go back to that history of the freedom movement. If you're thinking of what the contemporary era is and what the contemporary struggle uh, should, 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 should really be about. Uh, and I uh, had one more point I wanted to make, but I seem to be, uh, ah, yeah, the last, the last point I'll make and I'll end with this is the, uh, is the invocation again of uh, Professor Gandhi of the idea that we go back to history sometimes to see what we could have done differently. And we learn from that in terms of what we do today. Again, the, I thought the very beautiful point he made is that if you go back to the past, sometimes what unites us in the, from the viewpoint of history is more important than what differentiates us. But from the moment of people at that moment in time, they see only what divides them. So I think that's a very important invocation for today as well, when we think of how we can come together. And again, maybe reference Professor Gandhi's uh, piece in, the, in, in, in NDTV, uh, which I think uh, echoes a, a not very popular opinion. It is a defense, if I remember, of Rahul Gandhi, saying that he stands for certain values of decency and certain ideas. And it's not a job to rubbish him. It's a job to to see who are the ones who are opposing a certain kind of a political force, which is destroying what the constitution stands for. And how do we, in a sense, bring together a range of people who we may not agree with on every point, but we do agree with them on the fact that this, that fascism at every level should be opposed. So I'll just end with that by saying that, you know, thank you again for the really beautiful, moving and evocative talk. And it'll be wonderful to keep going back to that history to see how we can think of how, how that history is such a living history and so relevant in the way we take forward our struggle uh, today in every, every context as it were. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Professor Gandhi. Thank you for the opportunity to, to share my uh, thoughts. Thank you again. So, am I, am I allowed to respond? Yes, please, most certainly. <laughs> I'm very, very grateful, very grateful to have heard from Mr. Narayan what I have heard. I'm absolutely thrilled with it. Truly, I am. And he's such a young man, and all of you are so young, all of you, the teachers, that I'm seeing on the screen here, which means that I can really comfortably now uh, retire and, and, and leave, leave the, uh, the work to all of you wonderful uh, women and men. And I'm, uh, so my confidence has been enhanced as a result of this interaction. I will just say one uh, uh, 
one, uh, what was it I was going to say? See, um, yes, uh, the, the point that uh, Mr. Narayan made about uh, uh, those uh, during the riots who protected the others, that they had to be memorialized. The Hindus and Sikhs who saved Muslims, the Muslims who saved Hindus and Sikhs should be remembered. That is a very important, and I think taking that to today's situation, there are so many, we are unhappy about so many things that happen. Uh, but we all know it, we read about or we come across, even in our conversations, even during COVID time, we meet some people, we converse with them, we hear of some wonderful stories of courage, of friendship, of assistance to the needy, to the vulnerable, uh, to, the, to, to the persecuted community. So if we can share these stories, preserve these stories, make something of these stories, re, uh, draw confidence from these stories, each one of these gestures of, of kindness, of protection, of, 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 uh, of speaking out, of fighting for the rights of the deprived or the persecuted. Let us treasure, preserve, write, celebrate, share, underline, turn into stories, turn into so songs and poems, these wonderful gestures of humanity. Uh, and what is happening in the world as a whole yes, gives us great anxiety and great cause for pain even and unhappiness. But in the midst of all this, there is hope, uh, there is initiative, there is uh, in ingenuity. Uh, so uh, thank you for, uh, for uh, sending me away from this interaction with, with more, uh, more confidence than I had before.